All right, we will reconvene here. Is everybody ready? Everybody looks ready. And we will hear from the sheriff about um, operation enhancements in our corrections division. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, I have a PowerPoint uh, prepared, so uh, I will hand this out to you so you can follow along. Thank if you. If you want to make a uh, note sure. um, during the presentation or for future reference. Thank you. Um, and I'm dealing with technology tonight. And uh, you're going to have to uh, hang there with me. We can, uh, we can. You, you will get points for brevity. <laughs> oh, Cheryl will give you lots of points for brevity. Oh, here we go. It's ah. going to be a high score tonight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You get points for me for a taser demonstration. Also, so. <laughs> it's a good thing we had snacks. Okay. <laughs> He's volunteering me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What a guy. What we got? <laughs> Last time they put us together. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, a couple comments before I get started. Uh, first of all, uh, we've been working uh, the past two or three weeks to try, uh, try and put together an update for you uh, on some things that are uh, ongoing that may be short term and long term. Uh, just to let you know, we've had some requests <laughs> since the uh, board information went out on Friday um, to find out what's going on and we thought it best to let you know first what we're talking about so that you will have an opportunity to ask questions and that um, you are the first to hear this. We're not trying to hide anything. We think you need to hear this information first. Um, so uh, you can make notes uh, on the uh, on the presentation. Unfortunately, Captain Ritter ran into some airline delays today, and uh, I told him not to speed to Traverse City from Grand Rapids. So he will not be here. Uh, some of these questions I may defer to Captain Ritter uh, because I want you to hear the correct answers. Um, and finally, because of some recent issues regarding the jail, uh, I may refer your questions to our attorney. Um, so collectively, these items could be classified as ongoing, short-term, and long-term. And I would ask that you jot down your questions and let me um, answer those at the end. There is a little bit of a flow here. Some of these things um, interact with each other uh, in the presentation, but not immediately. So, there's a little bit of a backdrop and a foundation uh, going forward with this presentation. Uh, some of this information is not on here. Yes, you just keep pressing that. There you go. Yeah, there we go. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> I warned you. This is technology <laughs> and me. It's kind of like oil and water. So, first of all, uh, the jail when it was initially constructed in 1964. It was a linear jail. Twenty years later, they did a, a remodel and an expansion with a podular design because that's how they did it twenty years later. In 2004, there was another remodel and expansion and that was a direct supervision design. The jail's rated capacity today is 168 inmates or beds. Based on the facility's design, we're often only able to use 162 beds. If you are to operate efficiently, the jail should operate at 85% of its rated capacity, which means 143 inmates. So to run that place efficiently, we should have 143 inmates in there. 
So we've been boarding out inmates to try and keep that population around 143 so we can operate it efficiently. That keeps the population manageable. When it's overcrowded, that's a problem. It also satisfies classification requirements. We have to move people constantly in the jail. We have to have places <coughs> for them to go. If it's overcrowded, if there's too many people in there, that's definitely a problem. So we house out inmates. Other agencies want our best inmates. You've heard this before. So what are we left with? We are left with the high maintenance inmates who require more intensive supervision. We do work closely with the court system and try to release inmates prior to the full completion of their sentences. Um, we have some guidelines we try to follow with the courts. They've been very good. The problem now is getting to be there are very few people who meet our guidelines before we go to the courts and ask the courts to reduce their sentence, depending on what it is. You've heard me say before, we have more felons in jail than misdemeanors. So um, I looked uh, today, we have uh, uh, 168 inmates on our roster, 22 of them are boarded out. That brings the population down to about 144, if you use the old math. So we are considering, because we do get spikes, uh, we may, population may go down, and we may be in that 140, and now it's up to 160, 165, 171, I think, last week. We don't have a lot of control over that. We can't tell the courts, no, nope, sorry. We can't bring them here. We're not going to tell our officers not to arrest people and bring them to jail for crimes they commit. So that's a real moving target, especially when it comes to budget. How much money do you need next year to board these people? Tell me how many people we're going to have in the jail, and we can come up with a really, really close number. So we're looking at that. Boarding out's costly. Uh, we pay $30 a day. Uh, typically to Leelanau County, which is a pretty good rate, actually. Um, but um, our, our, our boarding rates, depending on the population, goes up and down. Coupled with this, we've got some staffing shortage. In 2002, the study recommended that we needed, in 2002, that was 16 years ago, we needed an additional 12 corrections officers. However, that was when we also had the work release facility, which we closed a few years ago because there was very few people in there and it was very staff intensive to do that. So what that did was to take four corrections officers and put them in the main jail with at that time, I think maybe six inmates. So we had four officers dedicated to take caring, taking care of six inmates. And that facility was only able to house minimum security inmates which are less than our minimum security in the jail. We asked the Department of Corrections what would it take to you know, renovate that, to bring it up to standards where we could house regular minimum security people and I believe um, we have talked about this before the answer was you don't have enough money. So right now according to the 2002 study we are eight officers short, eight full-time corrections officers. What I look at is our schedule. We have 34 corrections officers Are they all working? No. Why? Well, we do have a couple of vacancies, okay? And we're in the process of filling those right now. We have one officer that is in the service. He's on military leave and has been for almost two and a half years, if I'm not mistaken. 
we have officers in training. So when you have somebody in training, that's two people doing the job of one. So when I talk about staffing shortages, it's not, we need to hire two people. I look at our schedule and filling the schedule with 34 people, and right now we're five short. Five and eight is 13. That's an unlucky number. So what do we do to fill those vacancies? Put in overtime. We schedule overtime because we know people will be gone. They get vacations, they call in sick. Uh, we found out that when we actually schedule this, and the next thing is uh, we're scheduling quite a bit. However, um, we used to be on 12 hour shifts in the jail, very long days. Now we are on eight hour shifts in the jail. In the jail. It's more predictable and we can schedule that overtime. Officers can sign up for it. It's working much better. However, it costs us money. So the internal remodel. <clears throat> About a year ago, uh, uh, in April or May of last year, we looked at an area in the, in the uh, main part of the jail to see if we could remodel that for um, medical isolation shelf to put maybe three or four uh, inmates in there that could be more easily monitored. Uh, they did not have to be in an observation or isolation cell in the main intake area. Uh, we need some more beds. Uh, we need some specialty beds. Uh, this is an immediate need. Uh, we have some preliminary plans that are being reviewed and we're working through some operational issues. Once we put the plans out there, we think it works. Now we have our officers saying, yeah, that looks really good, but this problem is going to occur, or this problem is going to occur. Um, so we're trying to work through that to see if we can't make that work. If we can, currently there are four cells in the intake area, in the observation area. Uh, where there is a lot of activity. Two of those are observation cells, two are isolation cells. Uh, the, by the way, the uh, medical observation remodel, if you will, uh, we've budgeted for that. The money is in the budget for this year. So those two cells that are uh, isolation cells, we're looking at uh, a, a a remodel there which is basically changing the windows and the doors those would be observation cells um, <clears throat> community mental health mental health treatment in the jail community mental health currently provides and this is Captain Ritter's part of the presentation so I'll do the best I can they provide urgent and emergent care to all inmates of the county jail. Two weeks ago we had eight people on suicide watch. If I'm not mistaken, they were in our observation and isolation cells right up front, two, 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 and two, total eight. CMH supports registered clients, their clients, their consumers, with caseworker visits while they are incarcerated but there's a gap in the services. Our inmate population, which requires mental health services of our inmate population that require mental health services, CMH covers 30%. There's the gap. So as uh, from, from March 1st to March 15th, we had 83 mental health referral requests and of those, 29 were urgent or emergent and received intervention from community mental health. Of the 54 non-emergent or urgent referrals, 28 are still awaiting some type of care. Correct Care Solutions, our medical provider. We have a contract with them to provide medical care to the inmates. They contract with a psychologist to provide 20 hours a month of mental health services for those inmates who are not registered CMH clients. 
So we're looking at a proposed contract amendment with Correct Care Solutions. We're going to be asking to amend our current health care contract with Correct Care Solutions to include either a full-time psychiatric nurse practitioner or a clinical therapist. This is to provide the services for the other 70% of our population with mental health issues that CMH will not take care of. You might want to hold on to your seats. A clinical therapist estimated eighty to hundred thousand dollars annual cost. Psychiatric nurse practitioner estimated at two hundred forty dollars a year. Why? Two hundred forty thousand. Two hundred forty thousand. Yeah. Excuse me. What did I say? Two hundred forty dollars. Two hundred forty dollars. Uh, I was wrong. Yeah. yeah. Three zeros. So, why is that? Those are big numbers. Because we're in Traverse City, Michigan, and in talking with Correct Care Solutions, it's hard to find these people in Northern Michigan to provide that service in the jail. Those are kind of ballpark. We haven't sat right down with them, but we're going to do that and hopefully very soon bring back um, a proposal to amend my, our contract so we have one therapist or a psychiatric nurse practitioners working in the jail 40 hours <coughs> a week. 40 hours a week. So we're still working with them to finalize those costs. Criminal Justice Coordinating Committee, Planning of New Institutions, PONI, P-O-N-I. So in August of 2014, three and a half years ago, there was a board resolution to establish a Criminal Justice Coordinating <coughs> Committee, which followed the recommendations from studies in 2002, 2008, 2014. In 2004, there was a Blue Ribbon Committee that was established. And in 2004, they examined the jail diversion programming and made recommendations. In 2004, the Blue Ribbon Committee anticipated the need for 250 bed jail by the year 2020. That's two years from now. The national, uh, 2014 National Institute of Corrections analysis of the prior recommendations concluded that the 2002 and 2008 studies were followed. We've had three and a half years pass without any organization or finalizing of a criminal justice coordinating committee. In July of last year, recognize this, Captain Ritter um, uh, spoke with me and said we need to get this started and we moved to, uh, went went forward with that there were some issues um, that was put on hold possibly to be incorporated with a jail ad hoc committee so if you have discussed and are creating a jail ad hoc committee for a new jail study the uh, Criminal Justice Coordinating Committee should be involved in that process. The PONY program, planning of new institutions. So if I can back up, <clears throat> very broad scope, Criminal Justice Coordinating Committee. What is their responsibility? Very broad. They look at the criminal justice system in the community from the officer on the street stopping a car writing a ticket arresting somebody taking them to jail charges by the prosecutor's office going to court trials plea bargains sensing by the court specialty courts all of that who needs to go where and how do they go through the system <coughs> and the end result is you're going to have some people that need to go to jail and how many is it so they're kind of the determining, broad scope, determining organization, if you will, to figure out 
what are we doing? Are we doing everything right? And who needs to go to jail? And how many? So the pony program is to cover uh, all the steps in considering a new facility. The major elements of that program, Criminal Justice Coordinating Committee, the capacity, the facility design, the location, the staffing, use of technology. Dr. Lathrop was a part of a group that went to um, uh, Colorado four years ago, I believe. Um, and um, this is what they talked about. Yeah, it's a process. Locally, some of the um, uh, some of the questions we would have um, that have to be ironed out: proximity to the courts, the sheriff's office. Where's it going to go? Uh, the records. We share the same building with the Traverse City Police Department. We have a, a, a joint record system. We think you should pri hire a project management consultant to oversee both the Criminal Justice Coordinating Committee and the Pony Program. Amen. Now, everyone may not agree to that. However, why, why should you do that? Well, you're not going to have a new administrator or a deputy for some time. And when you do, that person, again, is going to be drinking from a fire hose. Because there's a lot going on in this county. There's an election year coming up. Is this going to be the same board on January 1st? Maybe? <coughs> well, okay, doctor, I understand that. <laughs> So if you have a project manager, that would ensure the continuity of this process, not a stop-go. Because new people on the board, you know, if you start going this direction, a different board might want to go this direction. We've seen that. So this consultant could report to the jail ad hoc uh, committee. They could lead this process. They could run this process. <coughs> At least initially, be a full a full time uh, commitment. Um, it would lessen the burden on the county staff, on the board members, uh, save the staff time uh, throughout this project. A new facility. I don't think anybody here will argue we don't. We need a new facility. I don't think if you. Please raise your hand. If you've toured the jail, if you've heard us talk over the years. Okay. Oh, you mean if, raise your hand if we believe in a new facility. Yeah, you, you do. Oh, yeah. Okay, I don't think anybody will disagree. Yeah. We, want to, we probably have one today, but it costs a lot of money. Okay? We've heard comments that it will cost 30 to 50 million dollars. 30 to 50 million. I don't know who pulled those out of whose hat, but realistically, in June of last year, we surveyed uh, sheriff's offices who built new jails and sheriff's offices and asked them what their cost was and how many beds they got. Just called them, emailed them, they sent us this information. About 90000 per bed. Okay? That's 27 million. That's not 50. It's almost half. Is that a good number? Wexford County just built a new jail. Cost 12.8 million. They got 158 beds. Double that. That's 316 beds for under 26. I don't think we're talking 50 million dollars. So we need to probably get some reasonable estimates. As a start, there you go. We need to figure out, if you move forward, how it's going to be funded. I think you have three options. You can pay cash for it. You have $25 million in the bank? No, you don't. That's pretty much out. <coughs> Millage. Okay? You can have a millage. 
Will people support that? I don't know. That's another possibility. Everybody's got their own opinion on that. Or you can bond it. I didn't put buy a lot, winning lotto ticket for $247 million on there because I know that won't happen. So you don't have the cash. Would the public support a millage? Or you bond it? Brief conversations with the finance director and the county treasurer indicate that funding, it might not be as big of an issue as everybody thinks. You really need to ask them some questions. They've got some good ideas. Finally, if you're going to do a jail ad hoc committee, if you're going to set up the criminal justice committee and let them run their course, don't do it and run into the same dead end that we keep running into. How are you going to fund it? It all comes down to spend a year sorting all this out and it gets dropped. We don't know how we can fund it. We think you should figure that out first. So, <coughs> if, just if, the decision is to move forward with a new facility, all the questions have been answered. If you put that on the fast track, if you follow the process, Criminal Justice Coordinating Committee, the PONY program, and the steps that are recommended to be taken. Put it on the fast track. High speed rail fast track. Four years probably before you move inmates from one facility to the next. So we'll be in the same facility for three, four years. Four years. That facility right next door. We're not moving tomorrow. So I guess my question is the next step another 10 to 15 year fix and another evaluation or a decision that may last 40 or 50 years. I guess that's the end. <laughs> so uh, I'm happy to try to answer some of the questions if it gets right down into jail and other issues. I might defer those to Captain Ruth. Yes. I just want to support the idea of uh, hiring a coordinator uh, to help us through this process. I, when we were in Colorado, that became clear. You really do need a, a person um, that's really familiar with this, a professional consultant, like you said. That's, that's what I meant when I said coordinator. Because um, really nobody on this board has that type of prowess and, and that type of experience. The men that and women that taught us were those types of people, and they had they were, they were masters and geniuses at it. And you really need a person like that to make help you make these complex decisions. That's your decision. Yeah, I just I'm just telling you that's what I think, you guys. <laughs> okay, Cheryl. Um, Sheriff, uh, under the mental health um, under the mental health part of your presentation. Um, I was curious, you, you identified um, <coughs> that there were 83 mental health referral requests submitted by inmates and then you discussed a classification system of urgent or emergent, non-emergent or urgent. Who determines that classification? Is that someone from CMH or is that someone from the jail who makes that determination? Um, I, I would. I, I can't say for sure. Captain Ritter would answer that question. Okay. Okay. Could you get me uh, an answer to that? I'm sorry. Could you get <coughs> me an answer to that? Absolutely. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank yeah. you. I think the point is, there's a lot of those requests. Well, I, I guess my concern is who's making the determination. Sure. Is it someone who's qualified to make that determination, like a mental health professional? Not to suggest that a corrections officer isn't, but I would be surprised if they were. I'd agree with that. Tony. I have lots of little notes that I scribbled while we went through this presentation. Um, having been through this discussion a few times in the times I've sit here, 
uh, Judge Power is always very prompt to remind us that we have fewer beds today than we had 15 years ago. We closed 16 beds that were in the basement of the of the current jail. <laughs> it was determined they absolutely were not safe. We couldn't uh, we couldn't oversee and supervise the prisoners that were down there. Uh, we closed those 16 beds, and the sheriff alluded to the fact that we closed the 26 bed 26 bed uh, work release facility. So. The 40 beds that we gained when we remodeled the direct supervision area, when the sheriff and the and the city police moved out of that facility, did not even get us whole. So we we truly have fewer beds today than we had 15 years ago, and you know with the Department of Corrections requirements for classifications becoming more stringent, you know we talked about earlier that we truly have beds that we cannot use because we can't get prisoners that classify to go in them. So so that's a key, key piece. In 2004, I spent a solid year with the Blue Ribbon Jail Committee talking about you know, how many beds we needed. We looked at a half a dozen different ways of determining what our, what our goals and what our needs were going to be. And you know, the sheriff made reference to the fact that it was absolutely determined we needed a minimum of 250 or 300 beds by 2020. And we're not even close to there. Um, the staffing shortages, you know, we, we have to remember when we talk about the jail and the safeties in the jail, the people that spend the most time in the Grand Traverse County Jail are our staff. And, and the conditions in which they are working are deplorable, and there's nothing we can do about that at this current time. The $30 a day of boarding out sounds like, well, that's not such a big deal, especially when you look at our budget and we we weight the cost of operating the jail by adding in the legacy costs of the defined benefit program. Uh, $30 a day doesn't seem to be so bad, except we also have some transport issues. You know, we, we housed prisoners in Charlevoix a few years ago, and we literally had prisoners that we took to Charlevoix, and by the time the corrections officers came back to Traverse City, they were being told to come get them because they don't fit in our facility and we want them out of there. When you, when you get the phone call from the judge that says, okay, this guy's been implicated in another issue, I want him in the courtroom and I want him there now, Somebody's, two officers have to run out to Leland or wherever and get him and bring him back. Transport costs are a significant part of boarding out prisoners besides just doing that. Uh, the reference to the 2002 David Bennett study, David Bennett was a jail diversion expert. You know, he absolutely would, would told us over and over and over, no pre-sentence prisoners should be in the jail. Uh, there was a big long list of people that he felt should never be in jail, they should be in treatment. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm pretty sure Tom Power didn't agree, and, and I know that Judge Rogers didn't agree. Uh, but the long and the short of it is, I've said many times, jail population is about philosophy. <coughs> the philosophy of this community is, if you commit a crime here, your ass goes to jail. And and I think we have to have to realize that. One of the things that's not mentioned in this report that that we've been very very successful with is our community corrections program. I can't imagine what our numbers would be without that. We have. 100, I don't know, I didn't ask Sharice, but I'm guessing we're around 175, 180 prisoners out right today that would be in the county jail if it weren't for our very successful community corrections program. Um, let's see what other notes I have. You know, like I said, community mental health. Everyone in the room and pretty much everyone in the community has heard me bitch about community mental health for 20 years that I've sat on this board. We pay them $680,000 a year. One of the conditions, the enabling documents that created community mental health specifically states that community, community mental health is responsible to provide mental health services in the county jail. They do not do that. At the time that the thing started, they had, we had at least one, if not two, community mental health experts in our jail 40 hours a week. And Boss was there, and I'm can't for the life of me, I can't remember the other name. But anyway, when when those folks retired, there was no replacement for them, and the services kept dwindling down and down and down and down to where we're lucky if we get 
someone in the jail a few days a week sounds or a few like hours we, a week. Sounds like we get an hour a day. Well, a few hours a week. Five hours I, a week. But I'll address that one. Sunday, okay, though. but the the point about it is, and community mental health will come in and they'll give you give us our annual report and they will tell us how many how many people in Grand Traverse County they served with medical mental health services in 2017, whatever the year is. But the fact is, they are not meeting the mental health needs of the county. We took a number of, a couple of years ago, and we contracted with um, the first psychiatrist for uh, community mental, or in our jail, Dr. Conlon, I believe, mm -hmm. if my memory is correct. And, and that contract was like $78,000. Well, at the end of the year, we deducted that $78,000 from the community <laughs> mental health's payment. And there, there was all kinds of grief and, and, and <laughs> nasty comments being made about that. But, but the bottom line is we need more mental health services in the jail. As far as I'm concerned, contractually, community mental health is supposed to be providing those for that $680,000 we pay them a year. Uh, we've, done the, we've done the pony program. We did it in 2004. We did it again in 2014. Uh, in 2004, we had the people, I think it was 2004 anyway, we had the people from Colorado came here, a number of them. Uh, Dennis Liebert was, was one, and I, the names kind of escaped me along the way, but uh, we had people here. They toured our jail. They told us what we needed. And they talked about the deficiencies of our jail, the, the linear jail, the, the fact that we, we can't properly supervise our prisoners. It was determined, you know, at that time, one way or the other, you know, I, I know for a fact that in 2004, I made a motion to move up on Lafreniere and build a new jail. I, I remember specifically the night that I made the motion and I was asked to rescind the motion because I needed time to cool down. Uh, <laughs> I'm sufficiently cooled, but we still haven't met the need. Um, but the but the big piece about this is, is that we don't have to recreate this whole thing. We've been through this enough times to know we need a new jail. You know, whether we hire a consultant to come in and help us design that jail and site that jail, uh, all of that was part of the discussion when we purchased the Lafrenier property, that we could site the jail there. We've always had the discussion about it's outside of the county seat, so what are you going to do with the city police? The sheriff technically has to retain an office within the county seat constitutionally. Well, we can figure out a way to find him an office in this building that he can, he can take phone messages or something. But, but the bottom line is we need something about the new jail and we can't continue to wait. And you know anything that we can do to move this thing forward and expedite this, you know, Tom's absolutely right. It's five years. If we decided tonight we wanted a new jail, by the time we identify funding, we design it, we site it, we construct it, it's five years. And we all know what the condition of our jail is right now. You know, and, and whether, whether we like it or not, you know, what's becoming very apparent is the the, can, the type of people that are in our jail are significantly different today than they were 25 years ago. You know, I, I remember making statements that 85% of the people in our jail were, were drunks and the other 15% were there for crimes they committed while they were drunk. That's not the case today. You know, the people that are in our jail, we have some pretty nasty people in the Grand Traverse County Jail today. And, and I don't think the community has any idea who's there, why they're there, and how long they're there. You know, the state's been threatening for years to make us hold prisoners in the county jail for 24 months instead of 12. You know, if that, you know, as we look throughout the state, they are closing facilities on a very regular basis. You know, what are we going to do with these people? You know, we, we have to figure out some way to get this new jail built, and we need it soon. Uh, Dan, and then Tom. Okay. Uh, yeah, I agree with that, and uh, I uh, I think the sheriff is right. We we need to um, pretty soon get an idea how we're going to pay for it. And there's only two options: one is bonding, and one is a millage. And I I think we need to somehow get the pulse of the community which which one they prefer. Um, I do believe our citizens would support this. Um, 
because I know the character of our citizens. So we need to talk about that. Which which way? We only have two choices: either either a millage or a uh, or a bond. And um, uh, Dean, do you have any ideas on that? Well, those would be your two choices: to ask for a, a specific millage or to look at your own internal funds. And what we were thinking about. I mean, this is no secret. You have in your current budget, in your general fund, you have $1.3 million of annual payments that you're making on bond issues. Over the next three years, two of those payments fall off completely. In 2025, another payment falls off. And that would be approximately enough to cover the debt service on a new, on a new jail. So you have funds in your current budget that would be continued to be budgeted in subsequent years' budgets just to make a debt payment that would fund the, the, the construction of a jail. Your money well spent. Yeah. Tom? Uh, well, we need a new jail, and I would hope that we could make it faster than five years. And I'm glad that Dean gave us that information because uh, that probably is necessary to be part of the, the story tonight that uh, in a couple of years uh, we will have some money that we don't have this year. Uh, I hope that Sonny is here uh, as this process continues because of his wealth of information about the past you know, studies that have been done. I just recently pulled the studies off the bookshelf here at the county building and started to go through it myself to see what had happened in the past, because I, I wasn't here, but I do remember it. Uh, the before, during, and uh, after people are here tonight, and I'm wondering uh, if at some point this evening they could make a comment as to what, um, you know, what they believe we need to do. And also, I'm concerned about the, uh, the younger uh, population, the, the youths that are uh, being arrested, that what are, are we going to try to include them in this new jail or are we going to continue to transfer them out of the area? Because I would guess that the before, during, and after people are looking at the family support for people who've been arrested and serving time and that they would probably be better off if those people were closer to where their homes and families are. Uh, just as another idea that hadn't been discussed I would very much like to go uh, visit the jail in Wexford County just to get an idea how different it is, because I haven't been there. I have toured our jail here some time ago. Uh, and, and there's a lot of talk. Uh, if you look down into the Detroit area, uh, Wayne County is going to build a new jail. This is their second attempt uh, to build a new jail. And there will be a lot of information for everybody to read uh, in excess of what our decisions are here. Uh, if you go to the newspapers in Detroit, you can find stories about that. Um, but down there, they're going to include other things. They're going to—I think they're going to include an office for the sheriff's department, some offices for the prosecutor, and possibly the criminal court building. And they're considering all the transfer issues, transportation issues as well, which are considerable. Uh, and even if it is out at Lafreniere, you know, I'd say the biggest problem would be transferring back and forth to the to the courts. Uh, so I don't know what the plans are for the courts in the future, but you know that might in the in the very far future you might want to think about uh, relocating um, part of the court as well. Cheryl. Well, I think all of those are really important topics. I, I also think that that maybe there's some validity in looking at relocating our 911 system to be part of that law enforcement center and make it, you know. <coughs> part of that whole complex. But I think all of those issues are issues that would be fleshed out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that the, I, I, I believe that the purpose of the sheriff's presentation tonight was to light a fire under us uh, because we have been talking. I've heard this, this configuration of commissioners talking now for a year. 
while we've been doing other things like solving the pension debt problem and getting COA lined up and you know taking care of animal control and you know some other things that we had on our plate that now is the time yeah. it is the time for us to put this as a priority something that has been talked about and talked about and talked about and now is the time so I think what what I'm hearing is that that this board needs to commit to moving forward and all of these issues and probably a whole lot more are going to come out as we start exploring this this project so I don't know what you want from us tonight but I would certainly support forming asking the asking our chair to appoint an ad hoc committee to get started on this process and to see if we can't um, build some community buzz over this and get this project rolling. So. And I have that written down. And I have thoughts as to who I would like to be on that ad hoc. Do you want to oh, comment first? Before we go to that? Sure. Yeah. I, I would like Community Mental Health to answer to Sunny's question about the budget. And I, uh, I can do that. Okay. I'm the Vice Chair of Community Mental Health. Okay. So I can address some of those questions. Bob, did you have another question before yeah, I do that? I, I, some of the numbers just kind of surprised me when you talked about the correct care solutions, like the psychiatric nurse practitioner at 240000 I just Googled it while we're sitting here. And yeah, you say it's Traverse City, and but the, the average salary of a, a psychiatric nurse practitioner is 88000 uh, the high end is 123,000. So before we get into a contract for this, we need to we could hire somebody. We could hire two people for that for that price. So we really need. I know, I know in all the medical fields there's a shortage, but I think we really need to investigate what's the best solution here. And if, like I said, if you decide that 240 is what everybody wants to spend, I'd re recommend hiring two people for that. You know, um, but yeah. okay. And then one other thing. Yes. Um, you know, that study was done quite some time ago on, on number of beds. I'd be interested to see, and that'd probably be for the ad hoc committee, mm -hmm. how has that bed projection mm -hmm. correlated over the years? You've, you've got a long track record now. Granted, the op opioid, opioid ta, da, we know thing, what the drug addiction thing, has mm -hmm. probably put a big crunch into it and increased bed numbers, but and it'd be population. nice to see how that trajectory has gone towards their estimate estimation of uh, 250 beds or whatever in, in two more years mm -hmm. so because that, the key to that too is make sure you build the right size facility mm -hmm. not too big mm -hmm. not too small but mm -hmm. something that um, you can grow into but also we're not having to lease out a lot of beds or whatever, so. mm -hmm. okay um, I can address some of the questions that came up about community mental health the the contract that we have with community mental health is actually it's called an enabling agreement it is not a contract for specific services it's an enabling agreement that five counties have with that enables the five counties to contribute to and form Northern Lakes Community Mental Health Authority so that's what it does it does indicate in there that part of the services they provide in the county are services to the jail however it isn't specific. It doesn't say comprehensive services. It is not a contract for specific services that they offer. Community mental health is a, a, a mental health authority and they are very restricted as to the types of clients that they can serve um, and that has to do with Medicaid because most of their funding comes from Medicaid. They get millions and millions of millions of dollars into our area because we have this mental health authority and that is how we get the Medicaid dollars in. So people do have to qualify um, in order to, and they try to get people in the jail to qualify. A lot of people that are in there do qualify and become patients of community mental health. Some of them just quite honestly don't want to become patients of community mental health um, and refuse to give any information so that they can get qualified. That happens a lot. Um, the, so the enabling agreement really isn't a contract for services. Another issue that they do have that, that the sheriff pointed out in, in his presentation is you can't force 
the people that work for community mental health to work in the jail. Um, it is hard to find people, um, psychiatric practitioners, to work in the jail. Um, it is very costly. Um, the people that they have working for community mental health, it's, you can't force them to work in conditions that they're not comfortable with. Perhaps if we had a different kind of jail, if our conditions were better, that they, they can't force them to do that. So um, that is why there's this gap that, that they ask for mental health um, help and, and if it's emergent, they, they do get it. If it's not, it, it kind of has to go through a process. So I hope that answers some of the questions. It's not a matter of going out and saying we don't want to contract with community mental health anymore. That breaks up an entire health authority of five counties. So that's not really a possibility to go out for an RFP separately for community mental health services. There, it's, it's a way bigger organization than just the organization that provides services to the jail. So I hope that answers some of those questions. Did you have another one? I have one, I guess, for the sheriff and under sheriff. Did that Blue Ribbon Committee look at that end of it on providing mental health services, or was it just at a new facility? And then what what are other counties doing? Are they providing their own, I mean, are they providing their own services and hiring their own employees to do this? Uh, a couple things. Number one, I wasn't around with uh, in 2004, so I can't speak um, uh, to that. Um, I, I would think it would have been an issue. Uh, realize that we are the largest county in the state north of Grand Rapids. So we don't compare to Leelnaw. We don't compare to our neighbors. If we want some comparisons, we have to go elsewhere. Yep. Um, and to your point about the cost, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I dropped over $240,000. Um, yeah, we could hire our own. Um, that has been an issue in the past. Uh, we were uh, hiring our own uh, nurses, staffing the jail. That was a real pain. You can't get people to work in there. Um, and whether they're part-time or full-time, we went through that. One of the major reasons that we went with a contract for those services in the jail um, it was finding nurses to work there uh, in that facility, okay? I've said this before many times, uh, dealing with our officers, whether they're law enforcement or corrections, okay? I've talked to them. It comes down to money. It's just that simple. You want to fully staff the jail? You want to fully staff um, our uh, road patrol operations and our detectives and never have to worry about staffing? All you have to do is agree to pay them $100,000 a year and we'll have people crawling over each other trying to work here. That's what it comes down to. I mean, that's, it's not complicated. So uh, I, I was floored at that price. Um, like I said, we still need to talk to them. We've been putting this together. It took us a week and a half to get this information. And honestly, uh, I think what they do before they enter, enter, enter into a contract, they want to find somebody mm -hmm. to fill that spot, okay? We got a contract with it. Well, we can't find anybody to do the job. So. Um, a little bit that true, but I don't disagree with you that that's a high number. And do we need to go with that number? I, I don't know. I, uh, I'm not. Um, uh, uh, I, we need somebody. We, yeah, we got. We have to have somebody. Coming. And uh, I've talked to Carl Kovacs at Community Mental Health. Um, I don't think we're going to get 40 hours a week from them. No. Okay. So we need to do this on our own, and maybe deduct that. What is, what from is the something payment. that we could do? in the near term short of that kind because even I think if we if we which again it comes down to money if we said well, we wanted to increase that contract that would probably take some time what could we do in the near term to help alleviate this uh, well uh, number one uh, we could ask I don't think um, and Commissioner you're right it's it's a five county enabling agreement mm -hmm. and that not only goes to pay for inmates in, that's for every yeah. person in the county all right, and they do draw, I'm thinking a one to nine ratio from what they get from the state or Medicaid, wherever they get their funding. And that's the issue with them, that they can't 
um, service these people in the jail because they won't get, they can't, they can't pay for it. So immediately, um, like next week or tomorrow, um, I think we have to look at uh, CMH and say we need somebody to hear more, but I think we need to go with uh, uh, C, uh, Care Solutions and pin them down with a number and say when can you start. That's my opinion. We could also look at the possibility, you know, when when Dr. Conlon left, we put out an RFP to try to fill a position, and we didn't have any luck with that at that particular point. You know, we can we can try that again pretty easily. We have we have that documentation ready. Mm -hmm. uh, I do That's know I do know that Dr. Conlon took a hiatus from here, went out of went out of the area. Uh, I also know that she is back in the area. You know, whether or not she would be interested in, in a contract service to our jail. She's very familiar with the facility. She's very familiar with what it is. Uh, I certainly wouldn't speak for her, but like I say, I do know she is back in the area. Uh, that, would, that would be a very easy first phone call for me. Dr. Conlin is the doctor of record for CCS for our jail right now. Oh, okay. I, I mean, I think we as a group, we need to decide, I, I know we got several decisions to make, but I think we need to decide what importance is it to help these people that are basically captive audience, for lack of a better term, and have probably hit a low Literally. spot. So we have a chance now to maybe turn around some lives, mm -hmm. but we are failing miserably at it mm -hmm. because of money, for mm -hmm. lack of anything else. And I think we need to figure out, is it a high enough priority for us to say, look, let's try to help these people because it's the hardest thing in the world to do is kick an addiction like that. I mean, anybody that, try, try kicking cigarettes if you smoke. And that's nothing compared to what these drugs do to you. Um, so I, again, I think this board needs to probably take a stand and say, let's move forward on doing what we can do because that's not satisfactory to have that many people asking for help and not getting. So, so can Sheriff, we get, can we can get you, some more data on who get, these people are? I mean, I, I don't believe that of these 83 people, they're all opioid addicted. I mean, no, they're are, not. These no, are they're alcohol they're, addicted. These are, and you know, legitimately domestic mentally violence. ill. They're, I mean, anybody who goes to jail, they're depressed. They, they're bummed out. That's why they take your shoelaces. I mean, you know, okay. it's, it's tough going to jail. Well, uh, uh, you know, this doesn't, um, doesn't indicate the, uh, for lack of a better term, the um, sincerity of the request. Okay, right. somebody may just want to get out of their cell and get look at somebody else. Okay, that's why I, asked I don't how, know I asked the sincerity, who made the and that's a, <laughs> actually that's, I believe it's the inmates. Okay, themselves so, who say whether it's emergent or not. We need more data. Yeah. Right. That that request comes either in many different ways, but it comes through our correctional staff mm -hmm. in some way, shape, or form. Correction staff is alerted that there is a pending health or a mental health crisis or an emergency, they make the referral depending on the level and you know, the protocol that they have in front of them as to is it emergent, non-emergent, urgent, and they give that to CMH appropriately. Um, I was in the jail today and I can tell you that we had a couple of these requests today. So w the corrections officers are not clinicians, they're not practitioners, they're corrections officers. They're not, I guess, educated well enough to to do those things, but they can have uh, value to have a face-to-face -face with an inmate and recognize that that inmate is in trouble and experiencing mental health issues or in crisis. So, uh, Mr. McMaster has been asking if he could make a public comment, if that's okay. okay and then I, I just want to ask. Okay, um, hold on. Um, I forgot. <laughs> I was listening oh, I'm to sorry. It. Yeah. yeah. Uh, It'll come let's back see, what was it? Oh, uh, okay. Madam Chair. Yes. Is the the ad hoc committee that you're going to be appointing here pretty soon? Could they address this issue too, so we could get moving at it right away? They could. What I was going to ask the sheriff is, can you get us some uh, kind of try to pin CCS down on better numbers? Yes. Yeah, um, we'll get something in writing. If you could, yeah. yes, and and we'll bring it to bring it to the ad hoc that I'm going to appoint. So I'm in saying a the ad hoc minutes. committee that we're thinking about forming yes. the jail could also handle right now this they issue. They could, yeah. yes, first okay. and foremost, we and, and we I would. Before. We handled the short-term solution, yes. which was the 40 beds that we constructed, and we looked at the long-term solution as yes. we needed a facility okay. that would 
Yes. Although 250 bucks. Okay. Nate, mm -hmm. did you have something? Uh, just to to clarify, the corrections officers, they have training in recognizing mental health crisis. You can't rely on that alone. There needs to be somebody in the jail that can provide adequate service. Uh, we have contracted physician service. We have contracted psychiatric service. It's insufficient. It's that simple. So, Greg, did you have some comments? And I'll, I'll let you. You have to step up to the well, microphone again. We'll get that information uh, Thank you. to you. Um, and uh, my question is, no one's the first meeting of the ad hoc committee. Let me do the we're gonna we'll listen to Greg and then we're gonna yeah. do the ad hoc committee and we're gonna let you know. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, the numbers I'm about to throw out to you are significantly higher than what you're dealing with here. But as the corrections chairman, my budget was over two billion dollars, two point one billion. Part of that had to deal with lawsuits where the lack of being able to maintain systems from camera systems, security systems, doors, you name it. Anything that created risk and liability to the inmates where somebody got hurt, there was a mistake that was made, it fell in my books and I had to carry that for the next several years. So now the state of Michigan is paying well over $150 million annually for the next 40 years because of systems that we couldn't address. Even with audits that came in, they weren't addressed. So I had to put a significant amount of money aside in the 2013 to 14 budget and address those. And it was to the tune of 150, 200, 300 million dollars to fix the problems so we can reduce those lawsuits that were ensuing and coming forward. And we were able to release and remove some of those with the Attorney General's help because that's what they wanted. They wanted, the families wanted closure, they wanted things fixed, they weren't looking for money but it helped alleviate the pressures of lawsuits that we had in the future. <coughs> Our numbers at the state level are significantly higher than yours, but the problem was still there, and I think you can understand where I'm coming from. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. I'm, I'm gonna appoint an ad hoc committee, um, and the first thing that I would like them to do is to deal with the mental health issues. And, and that's an immediate thing, so they are gonna need to meet very soon um, and, and get going on that. Um, also, they're gonna need to coordinate with the CJCC, the, uh, the Justice Coordinating Committee, um, and potentially, once they're, they've kind of established themselves, um, look into the suggestion of hiring um, a coordinator to help us with all of this. Um, so, I would like Sonny to head this all up for us. Yay. Yay. He has the knowledge and the background and the desire and the passion to do this. Um, I would like Tom Mayer to help. Okay. Can you do that? Um, I would also like to have, uh, Captain Ritter obviously needs to be part of that. Um, on that ad hoc and um, it was suggested to me that we have Phil Rogers. Um, I have not reached as, as like a citizen. I have not reached out to him, but I will. Um, that is where, that is the ad hoc committee that I would like to start with. Um, I think it's, it's, it's small, but I think that enables them to do some things rather quickly uh, and get moving. And we may add to it uh, different stakeholders here and there um, but I think that's what we're going to start with. Um, and they need to coordinate with the Criminal Justice Coordinating Committee, um, which I believe, Dan, you are part of that committee. Well, I don't know if you realize that, but you were appointed to that committee back in 2014, the I CJCC. Didn't know that. You are. Yeah. So that's why you're not on the ad hoc, because you're actually on the CJCC. And okay. that's where we need you to be. See that, see that, Commissioner? Yes. It's in the Sheriff's PowerPoint presentation, but really what we need to do is reestablish the Criminal Justice Coordinating Committee. We do, so we're gonna have to do that on April 4th. Right. Can we bring that back April 4th with the research as to, as to appointing the correct people, making sure those correct people are at the table at the CJCC and get that moving again. Because <coughs> Dan didn't even realize he was actually supposed to be part of that. Well, <laughs> it's been a while, it's been sort of dormant, yeah. and so we need to have that revived. There's been one meeting, I went to one meeting in November, because uh, it was, it kind of came up and we weren't sure exactly who was supposed to go, so I volunteered to go. Um, so we will bring that back 
on April 4th to do that. Okay? I will reach out to <coughs> Phil Rogers. Yeah, if he doesn't no. accept maybe uh, do you have another suggestion? a retiring judge or a retired judge. Right, right. You think would be a good addition to get it started. I'd also suggest, you know, if, if Greg would be interested, you know, we, we can certainly use the input and the experience. He's not a Grand Traverse County resident. Mm -hmm. But we can work with that. We'll see what we can do. You know, we, when, we, <laughs> when we did the Blue Ribbon Jail Committee before, the committee was pretty large. Okay. And, and it got a we can add to it as along. A, yeah. It got a little cumbersome along the way. And, uh, you know, if we can keep it small, I think we can get keep them more streamlined, we can possibly move things <coughs> quicker. quicker, at least to get the short-term piece. Get it, get these we things We need some short-term things that we need to do right yes. now. And right. I don't think it's going to take us very long to identify some of the short-term things that we no. can do right away. You know, we're going to, obviously, they're all going to come on a price tag. They are, so but, but you and Tom where that can from. work very closely with um, Captain Ritter and, uh, and get things going. And like I said, if, if we keep it small like that, then we can get it going very, rather quickly and get some things accomplished yep. right away that make a, a meaningful difference. Okay. Okay? Mm. Everybody has their homework and their assignments. Thank you, Sheriff, very much.